If you're looking for a clean, sober, professional, academic, well-researched, historically accurate, generally accurate, serious podcast on Southern folklore, ghosts, bizarre events, and unique people, this podcast is not for you. However, if you've decided you can live with that, then join us for The Strange South. Special with mm-hmm. the thick paper and like the yeah, and they're collectible. Decade and was review. Valerie June their first issue or was it just the one, the first one that you got? Probably the first one I got because it's still I, under there. It's a really cool mm-hmm. one too. You know, no, I think that may be the first one because I don't know. I have to look it up, mm-hmm. but I pr- I got pretty early on because I'm a um I I have a card carrying bitter southerner. <laughs> and, and that's the only way you can get these right yeah you have to like join their membership and pay so much a month mm-hmm. which i do because it is it's quality everything it's yeah. quality magazine quality writing quality stories quality photography like you said it's an art piece and it's it's a collectible so i will be more than happy to and usually like like our graphic design uh magazines which you know, the magazine world, just like newspaper, has kind of gone almost obsolete mm-hmm. because of the Internet and digital printing and or, and all of that. But there's still like some some magazines that are out there, but you're going to pay more because, you know, it's not as you don't have as much sponsorship, I guess. You don't have as much advertisements. Not a, you know, you don't take your magazine to the pool side. You take your phone. Yeah. And printers. If they have fewer books coming through, right, it'll cost them more Way to produce more. each yeah. book. So absolutely, so it's more of a it's just like uh, mono records become more of a collectible. Yeah. Um, so I do not kind of blink a eye at paying, you know, twenty over twenty bucks for a magazine because I do see it as like like a hardback book that you would like invest in. Bitter, bitter Southerner. To bitter, the bitter southerner. To the BS. And yes. the new Jason are we is on? version. We are on. We're on. Oh, yes. good. That was everybody intro. gets the benefit that was, of that. That was our pre We like, we like the bitter somebody southerner. Somebody who has worked in magazines for so long, it's always sad to say. Because I think magazines have been dying since I started working in magazines. I'm personally <laughs> responsible. That's how I choose my careers as well. It's like, <laughs> oh, are, are we fussing to die off and make less money? Then that's what I want to do. Yeah. When I started working, it was like, they had just started doing e-readers and they were those clunky, just like you slowly had to wait for the page turning it's graphic horrible. to come through. And they, mm. they were a mess. So it was just like, this is never going to take over. <laughs> right. Exactly. I feel like, though, right now I need to do a hi, Marleya. <laughs> hi, Patrice. I felt Courtney too. I was up. like, oh, we're going so long and they're not saying hello. Oh, my God. How will they know that we've started the show? You know, I would love to say that you may be the least anxious of the three of us. And yet somehow. I'm always the one that's like, why did we not say hello? <laughs> why are we not using our structure? I need Who structure. Hello, you didn't. I just said hello. Hello, Patrice. Courtney. Thank you. Thank I you. I said hello. Oh, it's all out of it's all out of hand now. Now everything's <laughs> fucked. Everything's <laughs> fucked now. We might as well go the way of the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We single handedly killed podcasts. podcasting. <laughs> you killed podcasting. <laughs> oh shit. Oh my god. I hope we don't have to look back at this as like our, <laughs> when we oh, jump the shark. Oh my god. <laughs> This is this is how, how it happened. How could it be now of all times? <laughs> Up front, fun stuff, fun. updates, any goodness? Oh, sorry. I thought you were... Oh, I, I am. Uh, I just want to make sure that no. you didn't have any. And they didn't know that I said I was going to do it. So uh, I was so, just sharing uh, oh, with them. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My God, what a shit show. <laughs> I'm telling you, I feel all out of sorts. I don't know. I do Wait, you know what? Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Hold on, hold on. Pause. Okay. Pause. Okay. What are we going to do? Hi, Patrice. <laughs> Hi, Marleya. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Courtney. I'm so glad to be here today. For a second time. I have some fun upfront stuff. I know Courtney has an interesting thing because I was there when she discovered it yesterday at her mom's house. Maybe since I've teased it, why don't you start us? Off? First off, I have a brain freeze and I'm crunching ice. Oh well, I can we I can need, go. To, well, we need to talk about this drink first of all. Let's talk about this it's drink. It's just classic. It's just all there is to it. 
all the things I've done try to be fancy, fancy that I'm just not that fancy, really. Everything that you've done has been amazing. <laughs> yeah. so I don't know what you well, are talking I feel, about. Well, I, I, feel I wasn't guilty sure how to respond to that. Because it's, like, it's, two <laughs> week, it's two, not weeks, but, you know, recordings in a row where I've made margaritas. Mm. So the last one was the oregano rita. No. Oh, no, it wasn't. It isn't. No. We did an old-fashioned. I old did fashioned. smoky old-fashioned. Yeah. Well, I feel like I just did a margarita, which I did, okay, two episodes ago. But I decided today, in honor, in memoriam, Jimmy Buffett, mm-hmm. to, to Margaritaville. Who, in Cheers. podcast time, passed away yesterday. Yes, in podcast time, passed away yesterday. I am not a parrot head, uh, but I do really respect the whole Margaritaville lifestyle. Mm. I love um, beach life. It's always been my dream. My second career would be a beach bartender. I've told everyone I've worked for for the last 15 years, mm-hmm. if, if I don't come back to the office, you know, I've moved to the beach and I'm a bartender now. <laughs> it's really funny because I goal. actually do expect you to do that. I will. I'm like, like, it's like not retirement. something, it's not like people say like, yeah. I'm going to go become a pilot. Mm-mm. It's like, no, actually, she's going to move to the beach and become a bartender. <laughs> That's my goal. So it's just a classic frozen margarita it's for delicious margaritaville course. i used um mm-hmm. i used margaritaville tequila uh mainly because we didn't have any 1800 left and i had to go to the smoking joe <laughs> but it was it's back. good it's themed it's perfect it is and you know the jimmy buffett lifestyle you know that he made a lot out of that one song yeah. kudos to him for that yeah absolutely i know i do i know some of the other ones and i was singing them yesterday but uh right i was just thinking about you know, we've all heard it, and it's kind of like one of those songs you're like over it. But then sometimes when you hear it, you're like, "Yes, I'm really in the mood." Right. Well, I also just chill. always sing. Like I spent this whole mm-hmm. time before we started mm-hmm. recording singing it, mm-hmm. even though I don't remember all the words mm-hmm. because that's just what it does. Yep. Right. Everybody knows it. You don't. It's not unpleasant. It's a song you mm-hmm. like to sing. No, absolutely. So wasting away again in Margaritaville. That's what we're doing today. Cheers. And these are frosty and they're yes. frosty and, and cold. They uh. are. I was treating mine like an ice cream cone at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm. So well, now we have straws. I've learned over the years the secret. I don't make a lot of frozen drinks, but when I do, it's when I'm at the beach. Mm-hmm. Oh, my pina God. Pina coladas that yes. I make at the beach. Your pina coladas and are you've very got good. got to really, it's the ice. You have to put, you have to put a ton of ice in mm-hmm. it. Half mm-hmm. the blender needs to be ice and you need to let it just go, 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 go until it becomes like a smoothie and then pop it out. The secret the of the pina frosty. colada, though, go, is to pour a bunch of rum on top yes, of it that's the floater <laughs> that's, yes. the, that's the whole like mm-hmm. exactly but these are really good they're not too sweet i had no to they're very good them. perfect so fresh right. lime juice of course mm. lime juice triple sec simple syrup and, tequila. Um, tequila. Mm. delicious thank you mm-hmm. thank you cheers. Yep. cheers cheers so here's Demi. what do you have in your mm. lap there mm. yeah so we're gonna take a turn mm-hmm. from that beachy lifestyle I mean, I've got a funny thing to say. I could say it if you want, but you can do this. Say a funny thing right now. <laughs> One, two, three, go. God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> okay, so I, have a, so I have a Ziploc bag because my mother likes to preserve all things in Ziploc bags. Mm-hmm. Well, that's... And I found this yesterday. I went to check on her. She um, actually got COVID for the first time last week, but she's doing well. Good. Good. So really glad about that. Um, I'd heard about this letter before, um, and I don't know how much I want to say who it was to, um, but I can say who it was from and read the contents of I it. I am so intrigued this, right now. This letter is stamped on the front Alabama Department of Corrections inmate mail. <gasps> did you just find this letter or did you know about this letter? I knew about it, but I wasn't looking for it. I'd heard about it years ago. Okay. Um, and... Um, I just happened to be, we were cleaning up, doing things, helping mom, going outside. She's got wasp nest. Long story short, these papers fell off of the entryway uh, in the foyer. And I looked down and I was like, what is this? It's from Judith Ann Neely in Wetumpka, Alabama. Oh, from 19. Oh, my <laughs> God, Courtney, what are you doing with <laughs> From the July 6, 1983. <laughs> I'm trying to remember which episode that was, but I think it might have been in the first 10. It was, it was in the early mm-hmm. ones for sure. What the fuck? So if we know who Judith Ann Neely is, she and her husband were murderers. They um, kidnapped, tortured, sexually assaulted Mm -hmm. um, a teenager when she was a teenager still. She was 18 years old when she wrote this letter that I'm Mm -hmm. about to read. And she was in DeKalb County Jail in Fort Payne, Alabama, where she was caught because um, Mc... Milliken? Is that who she... uh, Uh, Lauren Lauren or Lori Milliken. It's it's Murder Than Waffle House. That's what it was, the Waffle House one. Yes. So um, 
she, um, uh, the jailer at the time in the DeKalb County Jail, this letter was to him. This, and she wrote this to him after she was transferred to Tutwiler Prison in Wetumpka after she was convicted. So the murders happened in 82. She was convicted in 83. And then this is July of 83. This is just a few months after she... So I'm going to keep his name out of it, but I'll just say like, so it's not a whole lot. There's not a lot to it, but you can just tell when I read it, like she was an 18 year old. I mean, she did horrible things and I'm not defending her. She is. And one thing that recently has happened, if you haven't, if you didn't know, in May of this year, she was up for parole again. It was denied. Oh, wow. And this How was. How uh, she be now? She's 59. Wow. Yeah. This was episode five, Murder Than Waffles. And that's the same one that you did, The Bell Witch. Right. So this wow. was way back. So, and that was when, you know, I mean, she's a local person. I'm from DeKalb County. And so the trial, it kind of, I mean, it was crazy, right? Mm -hmm. In a very small town in Fort Payne. But this is to the jailer. Dear jailer, hi, how are you? Surprised? Well, I hope that you are doing good and that everything at the jail is okay. I just wanted to write and tell you thanks for everything that you did for me. I appreciate all the visits that you let me have. She was pregnant at the time with her third child. And she had that child behind bars during that time. Whose babe? Whose child? I can't remember. I think it was, um, uh, what was his name? Alvin? Her husband. Alvin? Yeah. Um, she was married. I've, I've totally have forgotten all the. I think details. they were married. I think they were married. They were married. Yeah. He was much older. Okay. But this was her third child at 18. Shit. You have always been very nice to me. You're a very sweet man. I know that it was hard on you, the sheriff, and a lot of other people having me in the county jail. I'm really sorry about that. But everything worked out nice, and you are rid of me once again. I must admit that I miss being there. It was my home for six months before I came here. It still seems like home to me. I'd rather be there than here. But I guess that most everyone there is glad that I'm gone. I know that it's easier for you all, but you have to admit that I never caused any problems down there. I'm not one to do that. I mostly keep to myself. Well, what has been going on at the jail? In the little time that I've been gone, I hope that you aren't having any problems. Tell everyone that I said hello and that I'm sorry, but I can't write to them. I'm already in trouble for that. Well, I'll close here. Thanks again for everything. Um, I never did call you by your name. She used a nickname there so that I'm not going to use. I've always known you as this nickname, okay? Well, Skeeter. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. Well... Write to me if you want to. I'd like to know how everyone's doing. Take care. Bye for now. Love, Judy. Wow. Isn't that weird? It's like something that a kid would write to some friend of theirs who just went off to like college. Like a letter we wrote, wrote in 1980. Oh yeah. Oh, my God. So that was... Because it's just like she's just a... She was 18. 19-year-old kid. 19, 18, 19. Oh, fuck. I have so many questions. Mm. So, yeah. So weird. Wow. Um, yeah, that was from the 80s. She she has been in Tutwiler since then. Mm-hmm. She's still there now. Her husband, I'm almost positive they were married. He was convicted for a murder of someone from Georgia. They were both involved in both, but he stood trial for that one and not for the one in DeKalb County. She stood trial for the one in DeKalb County, but not the one in Georgia. He died in prison mm. in the mid-2000s, and she is still alive at age 59 in Tutwiler. She was sentenced to death, and she was the youngest woman on death row at the time of 18 years old. But in 1999, I think it was Bob. Who was our governor? Bob Jane? I don't know. I don't know. In 1999, our governor commuted her sentence to life in prison, and that's how she gets to go up for parole every so often. But she was denied in May. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was torture, like Drano. It was oh, very it was bad. terrible. No, the, I remember. The full, it was terrible. Yeah, the story was impactful for yeah. sure. And it was, we did that, yeah, episode five. So if you guys want to, you know. I'm not glorifying this by any means. I thought it was just interesting to think. I never knew well, how it's a, it's young an she was yeah. and like that. You know, I mean, it doesn't, Do you want yes, more it doesn't hurt to be week. kind to anyone, even if help. they are someone like you that. Can like, us she on Facebook, was 18 year old, and Twitter, apparently and pregnant in jail. Facebook and apparently he was kind to her. That didn't, South podcast. you know, to keep the chat change anything about her outcome. But I mean, you know, at least you have a story idea for us. I guess be nice. Or a story of your own to share. Yeah. Email us at so stories isn't it crazy? at thestrangesouth.com. Mm-hmm. Do, he did not write her Plus, back, by the way. Not, <laughs> not only help good. support the podcast, we'll be you right back. get free swag, extras, exclusives, and a discount on merch. You can find links to all these things on our website, thestrangesouth.com, along with photos, links, and show notes from every episode. Strange South t-shirts, mugs, stickers, and other goodies. See you there.
We're busy snacking as well. Oh shit! I'm I'm talking. Yeah, this is all you. I'm not prepared, so I hope you got something ready to go. Oh my god, I'm actually talking. It's been a minute. <laughs> Welcome to my shit show. <laughs> Come along with me. <laughs> I blew out my flip flop. <laughs> god Slept damn it! On a pop top. Did you spill it again? It's like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know. I think she needs the sippy cup. I'm There's trying to make sure it doesn't keep on. And soon it will render. Maybe it's that frozen concoction that helps me hang on. I thought you said Afros <laughs> and concoctions. Marlea's spilling that frozen concoction everywhere. Mm. <laughs> what you got for us? <clears throat> All right. So it is the beginning of September. It is. And you know what that means. It's the official start of spooky season. Yay! <laughs> so tonight I've got a chilling tale for you. Yay! Woohoo! Love some scary stuff. It is set in the late fall 1923. Okay. So picture this. It's Prohibition. Boo. Boo. Across the land. The jazz age is in full swing. But Love that. Love spooky easies. Not everything. Hate prohibition. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Not everything that glitters is gold because the KKK is experiencing Ugh. a resurgence. Mm. And the horrific Rosewood massacre, which we haven't talked about yet, has occurred in Florida. Mm. So it's a time of stark contrast where there's like an upswing in the economy, but we're still dealing with evils mm-hmm. throughout the land. Throughout the land. <laughs> Too Very much, dramatic. Too dramatic. much Dungeons and in Dragons. United States. In the United States. I want to talk about a man named William Crow. He was in his early 40s and he uprooted his family to settle in a secluded farm near Big Hill, Kentucky. And this is just outside Berea, Kentucky. He was a veteran of World War I. And during the war, William saw like... A bunch of terrors of war, right? It was a pretty horrendous. War. I mean, all war is horrendous. That's kind of a dumb statement. <laughs> but now that he's back, you know, he has a family and he yearned for a nice, quiet life. He married a woman named Hazel. She is strong-willed, intelligent, and she's from the McKee area there in Kentucky. And she grew up basically in the Appalachian, Appalachian, sorry, culture and traditions. They have two children, Eleanor, who is eight. She's pretty quiet, but very smart and intelligent like her mom. And she loves exploring uh, the woods and everything. And Henry is a 10-year-old who, like his dad, is kind-hearted and shares his father's sense of adventure. So during World War I, William Crow was stationed in a village near France and despite like having their own struggles, the villagers there were incredibly kind to U.S. soldiers. They used these unique symbols to communicate with the Allied soldiers different things because some of them didn't speak, of course, speak French, right? So one of the symbols was a cross and a circle, which meant they could shelter, you know, there in whatever location that they were at. It's kind of like, you know, this place is safe. You can hide here. And on a particularly harsh night, William and his comrades found refuge in a barn marked with this symbol. And this whole experience left like this big impression on him. These symbols were not unlike the hobo codes used by travelers in the U.S. to indicate Mm. what to expect from the residents of a particular home or area. For instance, a circle with two parallel arrows meant get out fast, while a drawing resembling a cat indicated a kind-hearted woman lived here. So when William and his family settled into Kentucky, uh, he carved a safe-to-camp symbol on his fence near his property. Hmm. And it was more than just kind of a welcome gesture. It was sort of him paying forward the kindness that he had received during the war. And he wanted his home to be a sanctuary, uh, much like the barn in France had been for him. Hazel, his wife, having grown up in Appalachia, 
wasn't averse to any of like William inviting folks in or any of the symbols that he used. Uh, she, having grown up with like around wise women and everything, would like post, you know, a few Hawthorne talismans around the house as well to help bring in good luck to everybody there. So a year after selling, settling into their new life, the Crow family found themselves in the grip of a fierce winter storm. The snow was like relentless. It was piling up in like these thick sheets and it turned the whole area like this ghostly into this ghostly white landscape. It was the kind of night that made you count your blessings for a warm home and a solid roof. And just as William and Hazel had put the kids to sleep and were settling in for the night, a forceful knock echoed throughout the home. Who could possibly be out in this weather, they thought. So opening up the door, William was met with a man in a heavy coat and dark traveling clothes, and he was covered in ice and snow. And the man just stood there, and his eyes were like pleading, but he was silent. He didn't say anything. So for a moment, William kind of like hesitated and was like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like, you know, it's there's like how first of all, how did you get through this weather? And then why you know, why are you knocking on my door and just standing there? You know, thinking, you know, what kind of idiot would be traveling in this weather? <laughs> you know, he, he remembered the symbol that he had etched in his fence and you know, it stood for sanctuary and he was like, This is the universe telling him to honor his promise. So without another word, William stepped aside and invited the man into the warmth, offering him respite from the storm. And the man smiled and entered. William said, I have a spare room you can stay in. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? And the man just simply pointed at the road. And so William's like, well, OK, so this man might be mute. And he was like, you know, it's not safe for you to go out. It's not safe for me to take you anywhere. He's like, look. Get warm, rest. When this is over, I can take you up the road in my wagon tomorrow. See, the Crow home had a unique feature that William Crow had built, and it was a guest room with its own outside door. So he built it kind of like an Airbnb, right? Mm -hmm. They originally built it for Hazel's parents to come visit, but it was a cozy room, and it was filled with quilts that Hazel made and books that William had collected, but it also had like an inside door or a door to the inside of the house and a door to the outside. And because William was no fool, he wanted, you know, he was like, if I'm going to like basically have people over and give them sanctuary, I still want to like be smart and keep my family safe. So it was just a precaution. He showed the man to the room and he locked the inner door behind him and returned to his family, both relieved and a little apprehensive. The Crow family retires for the night. But sleep provides elusive for William. It's not just the howling of the wood or the creaking of the house. It's something else, something that's kind of unsettled him. So a little after midnight, he starts to hear a thumping and a knocking coming from the guest room. It's erratic, almost frantic, as if someone is searching for something or trying to escape. William's heart starts mm -hmm. to race. He glances at Hazel, who he notices is now awake as well, and her eyes are wide open with concern. They both listen as the noises continue, each thump amplifying their dread. Then just as suddenly as it started, it stops and silence descends and even the wind stops blowing. And it's almost like the silence is so thick that it's suffocating. So William in his nice warm bed, bread, sorry, mm. William in his nice warm bed, like summons up the courage to go check on his guest. He unlocks the inner door and cautiously steps into the room, and the stranger is sitting on the edge of the bed, and his face has taken on this gray pallor, and his eyes are filled with, like, this feverish desperation that chills William to his core. He stands there, frozen, thinking this man looks like he's on the brink of death. Thinking of the symbol on the fence, he and his promise and his debt of kindness that he wants to repay, William, like gathers up all his muster and he nods to himself and he's like you know regretting never getting that telephone installed to call a doctor but knowing full well that a doctor could not make it out to his home in this weather alone so he locks in a door behind him and he puts on his warm traveling codes clothes and he heads for the front door 
only to find it barricaded by a mountain of snow. Oh. And Hazel tells him it's a fool's errand that he won't be able to make it to the doctors in Berea and back in this weather. But William is intent and also very stubborn. And so is the blizzard outside. It had like tracked them in the house. So William tries to dig his way through the snow, but it is relentless and it piles up as fast as he can shovel it away. He ends up going to the second story of his house and climbs out a window and goes down and walks over to the barn where they have the horse and buggy. And luckily, the barn wasn't blocked by snow because it was sheltered by trees. So determined to get this man medical attention, William makes his way to the barn, his lantern barely holding against the biting wind. And upon entering, he finds their horse Molly there, usually calm and gentle, but clearly distressed from the storm. Her eyes are wide and her body is tense. William tries to soothe her, speaking in hushed tones and offering oats, but it's no use. She's too agitated to be harnessed to the buggy. So defeated, William comes to grips with the futility of these efforts. The storm is unyielding and Molly is too unsettled to make the journey. He trudges back to the house, his boots laden with snow and his heart burdened with this guilt. He goes and he checks on the stranger and he knows that Hazel has added one of her talisman to the door. Opening the door, he looks in on their guest and now seems to be sleeping. So he goes and he locks the inner door again. And Hazel is waiting for him in the bed and her face is a blend of worry and a subtle I told you so expression about the weather. Now, he didn't like ever even talk to this guy, though, right? The guy doesn't talk. That's right. He's talking to him, but he's getting a response from this dude. So William tells Hazel that he couldn't get out. The storm's too much and the horse is too distressed. So there's kind of a mixture of relief and just guilt kind of blended in, but there's nothing like they could do. And he's like, first thing in the morning, I'll dig us out and go to the doctor. So they both try to go to sleep, hopefully, but it's an easy sleep. And they are sitting there wondering or laying there wondering if the worst is truly behind them. Margarita break. (laughs) Margarita break. I'm not even taking a break. I'm sorry. (laughs) Slurping it. Crunching. So morning arrives, the storm has finally passed, and the world outside is a pristine blanket of white. William feels a caution, a cautious optimism. Maybe today everything will be all right. He prepares some breakfast and he heads to wake their guest. Upon entering the room, he finds the stranger is laying still, too still. A closer look confirms his worst fear. Uh-oh. The man is dead. Ooh. The atmosphere in the room shifts. The air grows heavy, the temperature seems to drop, and William stands there staring at the lifeless body and just feeling the weight of the situation. He tells Hazel, and he's grateful that the kids are outside playing in the fresh snow. And him and Hazel, they go into the room and they search through the man's belongings, hoping to find some form of identification because they're like, who the fuck is this guy? Mm -hmm. And they find nothing except his ragged clothes that he was wearing. So William goes outside, locking the outside door as well, and he settles up Molly and fetches the sheriff and the undertaker. When they return, William unlocks the room, only to find that the room is empty. Uh huh. The stranger is gone. Uh-huh. Puzzled, he asks the kids if they saw anyone leave, and they said no. And So the sheriff and the undertaker both leave. Everybody's puzzled. They're questioning whether William and Hazel, you know, I don't think they question whether they were telling the truth. I think they just questioned, like, you know, how'd the man get out? Mm -hmm. So days pass since the stranger's death. And this sense of unease still envelops the Crow family because they don't know where the man went. But, you know... Things start to happen. Henry, their eldest son, and Henry's like 10. I don't think I did. I mention that before. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. So he's their eldest and he mentions that he's hearing whispers while doing his chores. And Eleanor swears that she's seen shadows darting in her room at night. And the family tries to go about their daily life. Hazel focuses on her quilting. William tends to the farm animals, but the atmosphere is different. It's kind of on edge and it's charged with this unspoken tension. Their horse, Molly, hasn't been herself since the storm. 
She's skittish. She's often neighing loudly without reason. One morning, William finds her standing outside the barn, the door ajar as if she's refusing to go back in. A few days later, the family gathers for dinner. The meal is quiet, and each lost kind of in their own thoughts. Afterwards, William's walking around, and he spots something on the fence near the road. And it seems that the markings that he had there had changed. Somebody has scratched them out, and a new symbol was in place. And it's a circle with two parallel lines, meaning be prepared to defend yourself. And he's wondering, like, who changed this and what does this mean? Things, again, keep happening to the family over the next few days. A heavy iron skillet falls off the hook in the kitchen and nearly misses Hazel. And their new radio broadcast a sermon about death and in the afterlife without being turned on. So both children start having nightmares and are waking up screaming. And when questioned, they describe a figure in tattered clothes standing at the foot of their beds. The kids aren't the only ones haunted by unsettling dreams. William, too, has had a hard time falling asleep. And on the rare occasion that he does drift off, he is visited by a weird vision. He's not dreaming of a dark man or the stranger or anything like that. He is lost in the blizzard, a whiteout so intense that he can't see his own hands in front of his face. But then out of the snow, an old woman appears and her (laughs) eyes lock onto his and cutting through the snow, she says, come find me. And then William wakes up, Hmm. startled by her words. So over a very subdued breakfast, he shares the dream with Hazel. And he's like, the dream felt more real than anything I've ever had. It's like the woman she knew me. And Hazel thinks about this. She know she says, you know, there is an old woman up on Big Hill, and they say that she has certain gifts. Maybe she's telling you to stick her out. That idea ling- lingers in the air. Neither of them willing to really to dismiss it outright. And they go about their day, but their thoughts mainly thinking about this old woman and what she has said to do. So later they gather in the living room. <sighs> And William talks to his family. He's like, we need to address what's happening. Things have just gotten out of hand. Weird things are happening. I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how to like report it to the cops or the sheriff or anything like that. He's like, "Um, but, you know, since the visitor that we had, things just haven't been the same. And Eleanor, usually quiet, but always very perceptive, speaks up and says, you know, that man was kind of bizarre. Like, he made me feel weird, like, you know, like, you shouldn't touch when you shouldn't touch a hot stove. And knowing how much it affected the children, William and Hazel said, you know, we, why don't we just go, why don't, well, William says, why not just go visit the old woman in the Big Hill and see what she has to say. It's like, it can't hurt anything. So William heads up to the Big Hill after, and he, he goes, I should say, William walks up the big hill he doesn't take molly because molly again has not been the best of moods so william heads up east of big hill and he walks for hours and he doesn't really know where the fuck he's going so he just keeps walking and he happens to stumble upon the secluded cabin at the end of this trail and it's surrounded by herbs and talisman and the door opens and he's greeted by an elderly woman with piercing eyes and she's like i've been expecting you Mm -hmm. and so she invited william in and he's kind of taken back and she's exactly like he imagined so this old woman listens to william recount the unsettling events had befallen his family and he asks her for help and she looks at him and she's like and you think i can help you Mm -hmm. and then she's like do you believe in the old ways and william goes it's not what I believe. Like, it's it's about my family. They're suffering, and I can't stand by and do nothing. So the air kind of, like, grows tense and thick between them. And she's like, well, in that case, you'll need to sacrifice your firstborn what? under uh, the full moon. Uh, uh, with a twinkle in her eyes. And William just anybody, sits there, horrified, trying to find the best way to, like, answer this or escape the small cabin. And seeing the fear in his eyes, the old lady starts to cackle. Mm. And she's like, I'm just pulling your leg. Uh. <laughs> That's not how I do things. Very well, I'll help you. But know this, you're inviting the old ways into your life, into your home. 
Are you prepared for what that means? William nods kind of slowly and he's like, you know, if it will bring peace to my family, then yes, I'm prepared. But honestly, I really don't know what this means. So William leaves the cabin and again, he's confused and has conflicting emotions and trepidations. He knows he's stepping into unknown territory, but he's already in unknown territory with all the things that have been happening at the house and to his family. So he hopes this old woman and her unsettling humor can dispel this darkness. The next day, the old woman arrives at the Crow household and her demeanor is as icy as the winter air. And she's like, I need to stay the night to do this right. And everyone's like, okay. So, of course, they... um put her up in the guest room and William double checks the locks on the guest door (laughs) just to be safe. So that night, William and Hazel lie in bed again and their ears are tuned in to this concophony of strange sounds coming from the guest room. They're like, oh, great. And there's muttering and humming and a low unsettling kind of droning sound fills the air. And William's like, did we make a mistake bringing her here? And Hazel's like, I don't know. So they finally fall asleep. And the next morning, they wake up to find a bonfire roaring in the yard. And William's like, what in the world is going on? So he rushes outside. And the the wise woman out there stands beside the fire. And her face is stern. And she's like, it took you long enough. Now come here. We got work to do. So the old woman starts humming and her voice blending with the crackling fire. She throws herbs and the comforter they notice from the guest bed, much to Hazel's chagrin. (laughs) The flames change colors. They shift from blue to green and finally a deep red. And a low, almost guttural sound seems to emanate from the fire. Now, she says, put your hands out in front of you. And when she does, and when the whole family does, because they're all out there by now, she comes along and she quickly slashes Mm. each of their palms. Why do people always do that Uh, in these stories? I don't know. And of course, they're all like, what the fuck? And the kids are crying. And she's kind of like, hush. She's like, throw your blood onto the fire. And when they do this, the fire roars and then is extinguished. And it's just like the most bizarre thing. Uh, This whole thing is bizarre, right? And then she turns the ashes and the blood and she's like, this will bind it. So she's like, collect the ashes with your blood and go spread it over the doors and on the signpost and anywhere that the stranger was. And then once they did all that, it's done. And she states this kind of in a devoid, neither triumphant or relief just a matter of fact it's done as she's prepared to leave the woman turns to the family and she's like next time don't be foolish enough to invite a quiet man into your house and then she disappears into the woods (laughs) and so they're kind of all like what the fuck but strange things have been happening and they clean up the bonfire they clean up the mess they lock up the doors and months have passed since the old woman's the old woman's visit, and the life for the crows has returned to basically a semblance of normalcy. Yet the hobo marks etched in their fence remain kind of a constant reminder of the events that transpired. So one morning, William wakes up and he decides he's going to erase those marks. You know, he's he's done his due diligence. He's going to leave that room for his in laws. And he wants to sever the ties to this unsettling chapter of their lives. And as he approaches the fence, tools in hand, he stops dead in his tracks. The marks have been scratched out again and replaced with new symbols that he doesn't recognize. He stands there staring at the altered marks and a chill runs down his spine. And he looks at his wife, Hazel, who comes stand beside him. He's like, I didn't change them. And she, you know, reading his thoughts, said, well, neither did I. And they both know that their home and their lives have been altered because of this post. Their young daughter, Eleanor, ever the observant one, joins them. And she says, I saw the quiet man by the post last night. He looked like he wanted to come in, but something was stopping him. And 
she wasn't really scared. She was more like had a mix of curiosity, but cautious. And so Hazel turns to William and says, maybe it's best to leave the post as it is. And so they did. And now on cold, snowy nights, people in the area report seeing footprints along that lonely road outside of Berea. And some even claim to see a man standing silently in the snow near the old crow homestead. When they call to him, he never answers. Mm. 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 That's cool. So join us next week for the B-side and the source of this ghost story. And remember to mark your calendars for October 6th to kick off the Halloween month at Bromerin at Kerbo. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and all the things to find out more detail. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Bye, Bye, y'all. What are the symbols?